when when this was offered to me as an option and the new building over there the education building I thought this was appropriate for Polcat because it's a historic event and I'm just so pleased the Rand House has you know, done so much with restoration yeah. and, and, and that. So exhibits about Polcat Porter um, and he was here in the beginning of the NMLRA and he shot and my earliest exhibit is in 1933 which is a, a match uh, flyer from the third, 1933. This one's 36. 33 is in there. But he he lived and he shot through the you know World War One and he shot he lived in Akron and shot all over Ohio Indiana um, was extremely active at Canal Fulton in Ohio which is I paid attention I've got music in there it's from World War um, Two and also I brought this just to recognize he was in the he was in the war. And at home I have a clock he brought back from England in the war, really? so and it's up on the wall running. Um, it says that it was relieved from a bar, from a tavern, during the <laughs> fight, so however that came about. This is a picture of him that's taken from the Shooting Times magazine that we'll see eventually. This is first shot ever shot at Canal Fulton at the current range, and Canal Fulton range was moved, and that was shot by Porter. Uh, these are again these are match schedules and a lot of these are just kind of random and the purpose for the random schedules is to just let you know the widespread activity that muzzleloading during the 30s 40s 50s it was it was a very very large um, activity here's 34 36 Polcat himself was a fairly legendary guy now he the first time I ever heard from him I was with a collector and we were talking about Peter Reinhardt rifles. Reinhardt was an Ohio maker and um, the story I heard was that there was this crazy old guy who used to ride a motorcycle down to Friendship and he would get drunk and pass out in the field, in the cornfield, and it would rain all night. And then in the morning they'd bring him out and he'd wipe the rust out of his rifle and then they'd put him out on the line and he'd shoot and win. And that was the legend I heard. Well time passed and you know, at one point in time, I met a man who, when he told me about the rifle he had upstairs in his hotel room, I knew this was the rifle and this was the legend. This was connecting the legend. He had since passed away. This target was the first time Porter found Old Harrison, the old rifle, in the 1940s. And this is the first time it ever won, set a record here at Friendship. It was shot by Porter's friend, John Baldinger. Later on in the match, Porter shot the rifle and shot targets almost as well. But this one ended up getting saved. It set a record here at Friendship. It's 100 with 9Xs. That's 10 shots at 200 yards. This, these are the flyers from the 30s. Uh, again, this is the beginning of the NMLRA. This is before the Friendship match range here. Um, and these are some, this is good information to retain. This is the beginning of, this is Rising Sun and this is Porter was named, they called him Skunk Porter, they, you know, they called him all kinds of stuff. This target was shot by Ellen Grote in 1940, and it's pictured, Ned Roberts used this in the book Caplock Buzzle Loading Rifle. Um, interesting, Walt and Ellen shot a Brockway rifle, and this bench that we're looking at has been down here in the museum for years, and some people have actually rifled, used, used it in modern times, and it was shot, it was made by Brockway. These targets were shot by Brockway himself, who was a great 19th and early 20th century maker. So that's, these are pictures of Brockway. So. Interesting, you know, this is Ellen Grote, and these ribbons up here on the wall, these, were, these ribbons were won by Ellen and Walter Grote, if you read. And so it's just really delightful to see a woman who you know set records and historically you know was an important figure this is the crosley radio paul crosley early in the nmlra paul crosley was involved with you know endorsing these matches and encouraging and he broadcasted on the radio which was brand new media it was powerful and it spread a long ways so by announcing these matches also crosley would give away a radio to the winners so Porter won at least two radios, maybe more. These are all random pictures. This is an interesting, this Tom Schiffer's book, which is a wonderful history of the NMLRA. This, this book is just delightful. And it starts from the beginning of the NMLRA and it goes until now. 
Um, it's a recent publication, and if, you, if you, this is an endorsement, I would encourage anybody with any interest in history in, in this type of shooting to, to look at this book. Um, so someone just came through asking me for Boss Johnston, and there he is right there. But this, there's a paragraph here. It said, Red, meaning Red Ferris, um, mentioned that H.W. Porter was awarded a special trophy in recognition of a fine record of losing ramrods, a hickory shaft of liberal proportions wrapped spirally with colors well sprinkled with instructions for use in retrievable ramrod. Read that beak. Be decked and gorgeous, massive bow of ribbon was presented with solemn dignity and much clicking of cameras. So in this pile of stuff that was passed on to me was this ramrod. Now Tom did not know that this existed when he wrote that paragraph, so there it is. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's fun. Okay, this was shooting times. This was Polecat Porter had a number of articles and um, you know, they were published, and, and that's Shooting Times, that's from 1964, and I have the original magazine here, and I also have, there were earlier publications in the 1930s, and I do have some of those. And this is one of my favorite possessions. This is the day book from the Canal Fulton Range. That was Porter's. Porter was secretary in the what, 1937 to 39 period. And 37 to 39 was just post, um, just pre, just before the war and post depression. So this was not an easy time for everybody in Ohio. And when we look at what these guys through this notebook of what they were shooting for, they were shooting for pineapples. This was this was what we call a grocery shoot. And today we kind of laugh about it, we kind of joke about it, but they were shooting for sugar, beans, peaches, chicken, salmon, coffee, corn, turkey. They were shooting for serious food. It cost a dollar to shoot. That's a lot of money in 1937. So this little piece of folklore here, I think it, it tells a, a strong story about, you know, times, about what it was like during that time. This is old Harrison. This is the, one of the slug guns. This is a new porter shot. He was a buck skinner. He shot flint locks, but this is his target gun. This is for shooting the long range slugs. This shot the target that we looked at earlier. This was made by Peter Reinhardt in 1879. Um, it's still shooting. It's still We still use it on the range. This target here was just shot on 4th of July at 100 yards this year. And this is the trophy that is the Lester Cox trophy from Canal Fulton. Um, Porter first won this in 1958, and what you do, this trophy is rotating, so, you know, the winner takes it for a year, the next winner then takes it, and the next winner then takes it, so it's loaded with the history of the shooting at Canal Fulton on here, so. This old Reinhardt shoots a two-piece bullet, that's a hard nose and a soft base, and the two pieces are cast separately, weighed and joined together, it's shot with a paper patch, in the old days they used sperm oil and bond. Today we use freezer wrap. So we do use sperm oil and bond too when we feel a need to be historic. But And this is the bench that Porter shot. So when we talked about get, having Porter inducted in the Hall of Fame, I had the, these paper records and I had this rifle that I was shooting and I thought of Porter in terms of slug guns at Canal Fulton. Or at, at friendship because he shot down here with this gun from the 40s through the 80s a long time he shot this gun here and then that's what I thought of him so but what I didn't understand what I didn't know I sent the original draft to, to Tom Tom Schiffer pointed out he, the importance of Porter in early rendezvous and I well what's what's that mean because I'm not a buckskinner I've never really you know done that never dressed up in the fringe and all that and, but then I started re-looking at all this material and realized that, you know, here's a man who was buckskinning before there was television, you know, maybe there was radio, but he didn't get to, you know, grow up watching Daniel Boone and all that stuff that we did. He was, I mean, he, he kind of was, you know, an early pioneer in what I call resurgence of interest. So buckskinning, you know, to him was, you know, real important for the, the huge movement that we you know, that we enjoy today. So tomorrow there'll be a, another rifle here that belonged to him. It's an early flintlock, so that'll kind of reinforce that, that um, 
that piece. He did have a log cabin that up in um, I don't think that's I don't think it's Ashland County. It's up near it's up near Ashland County. Uh, might be Wayne County. He had a log cabin and he used to have shoots up on the on the uh, which were you know again with the buckskin. Yeah, one of Harold Polka Porter's favorite rifles was his John Philip Beck rifle. Possibly 220 years old. Uh, very fine engraving, raised, carved, and uh, very fine uh, brass work. It still shoots straight. And uh, he won evidently uh, any number of medals that we see here, as he did also with his Reinhardt slug gun.